It's the Bird Emergency. I'm Grant Williams and we're doing yet another Pint of Science Australia takeover with Ettore Carnalenghi. And Ettore is looking into a bird that I've had a couple of requests uh, to feature. And it's the it's one of our amazing little fairy wrens, the superb fairy wren. Uh, Atore is working through Monash University and he's exploring the complex family dynamics, the social structure of the superb fairy wren. Atore, thanks for joining me. How are you? I'm fine. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Now, let's, let's find out how did you get interested in the fairy wren and how did the start of the project come about? So, um, with the fairy rents, it was um, kind of um, luck. Um, in, in the past, I worked with uh, with other species in uh, other continents, mostly in the in the Amazon. And um, and after my my master in Italy, and I've always been very interested in social behavior. Um, <clears throat> I moved to to Max Planck in Germany to learn more about about social networks and and how this this um, computational technique can can help uh, biologists to to investigate social structure in, in animals and in birds and um, and in this period uh, uh, there was this this possibility to to do a PhD um, on the super fairy wren and uh, having the possibility to use this kind of technique the social network analysis to investigate it. And um, and I, I thought it could have could have been a great opportunity for me. And um, uh, at the beginning, I was um, a bit um, scared um, since uh, it was not a, a species living in a remote place, um, and um, as uh, as I used to 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 do in the past. And it's something I really enjoy about being in the field in remote areas. Um, and the superb fairy wren is quite the opposite. Is uh, is quite still luckily is still quite quite common um songbird in here in southeast of australia even if it's uh declining as many other species of, of passerines um and then this offered me the opportunity to really spend a lot of time in the field almost every day for years and observe and take a lot of data collect a lot of data and answer biological questions that otherwise i, I would have not been able and, and uh, day after day, I really got in love with these amazing little little birds. Well, let's let's step it out. What what is the the question that you're trying to answer in your PhD work? So um, I'm I'm trying to understand how the the social um, structure of the population is it organized like the, the, the society, we can say, how is the society of this little, of this little bear? And um, super fairy wren are, are cooperative uh, breeding uh, birds. And, um, and that's another good reason to be in Australia, because if you're interested in cooperative breeding birds, uh, Australia is one of the hotspots in the world. Here we have a lot of species with this uh, uh, breeding strategy, which means that um, the, the, the parents, um, so, so some of the of the offsprings of of, uh, of a pair of, of individuals stay in the territory, uh, sometimes for years, helping the, the dominant pair to raise uh, the offsprings, and so they form these stable groups, um, and and uh, and this is already very interesting from many many point of views if you're in, interested in social behavior, um, and um, um, in usually uh, many many biologists in um, uh, studied cooperative behavior during the breeding season because it's, um, it's, it's when it was considered to be particularly interesting. Um, but I'm, I'm focusing on the non-breeding season. And um, and then non-breeding season, it, it's a black box to really understand complex social behavior because we know from other systems, for example, in, in the teats in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, and then there are a lot of great studies on, on their social behavior and social um, com complexity in Oxford. Uh, we know that non-breeding season is where 
when a lot of interesting stuff happens, like a lot of complex behavior. And it was something nobody really looked at. So um, that was my main main uh, frame during PhD, understanding what happened in, in this, this long uh, period that is um, something like seven uh, months, um, uh, a bit less sometimes when they're not really on their breeding territory, feeding the offspring. What do they do? Um, and um, and yeah, like my PhD starts from there, and, and from there I start to to develop my questions uh, when I start to understand a bit more how the system was was organized. Okay, well, let, let's sort of introduce the superb fairy wren to the audience because not everybody will know the bird. The bird is tiny. You mentioned the 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 tit, the British tits. The superb fairy wren is a similar size. It's um, uh, just looking at my desk for reference. They're smaller than your computer mouse. They're about maybe two thirds the length of a of a computer mouse, or or even half. But they're they're tiny. But they have a long tail. So uh, the tail's what one one and a quarter the length of the of the body of the bird held erect mm. most of the time uh i i had a family of of wrens living at a place that that i lived in and they're um they're not timid birds um they're quite uh they're quite unafraid of people once they're used to them i think but they are pretty much living on the lower level. I, I don't think I have ever seen one higher than about three metres up in a bush, a big, a big shrub. I, I can't ever think of one higher than that, higher than a, than a roof line, really. Um, so have I got... Have I got most of that right? Are my assumptions about the bird correct? Are they always down low in the yeah, scrub? That's, that's, that's really that's really correct. They really rarely um, fly on, on on trees. Only when they're when they're scared from from um, ground predators such as us sometimes. Um, but usually they they are on the ground, and um, and then and um, they're. Dimorphic, the, the, the male uh, is blue and has the strong blue and beautiful color, while females are uh, brown. And um, and the male, the males have a uh, have a blue tail, whereas the females have a brown tail, but and the males will molt into an eclipse. Uh, eclipse plumage that really mirrors the females. The, and uh, the, the, this is how I always uh, assume that the and that the immature males only present into breeding plumage if they are either part of a dominant pair or are challenging to be part of a dominant pair otherwise they remain in their eclipse plumage and cooperate in the family now is it is that right because that's a 20 that's a 20 25 year old perspective that i uh, i sort of grew up with yeah it's quite it's quite um right i was going i was going there um and uh and yeah, like um, they, they molt into non-breeding plumage during during winter, um, and and uh, and then remolt during during the breeding um, before the breeding season in the in the breeding nuptial plumage, which is quite blue. However, as we said, and since they they spend a lot of time on the ground, they are easily easy target for predators. So we must imagine that is is really. Um, dangerous in a certain way to be so blue and so visible 
So what they do is that they molt into a, a non-breeding plumage during winter uh, in order to um, to be better concealed when when foraging on the ground, and then they molt into the blue breeding breeding plumage um, the males. Usually, also subordinates molt into the breeding breeding plumage. So all the males tend um, usually tend to be tend to be blue during during the breeding season. What really uh, is different is the time of of acquisition of this uh, breeding and nuptial plumage. And uh, so the the earlier the males molt into into this breeding plumage and the sexier they are considered by by females and this plays a very important role in their society uh, at the end of the of the non-breeding season so we, this really happens during the end of the winter when during the really cold months um so the females look and and this is something i, I really find fascinating and, and uh, it has been studied um in, for many years in in a population in canberra's and and also in in the group where i'm where i'm doing research at the moment females really remember the first individuals to mold into this breeding plumage and after months when um they are laying eggs usually two four days before laying eggs uh, 20 minutes before dawn in the morning they fly to the territory of that males and they mate with this with this guy with the super sexy one and then come back and, and in fact in the super fairy wren uh, we know that up to 75 percent of the of the offspring are not uh are not of the of the social father of, of the territory. So there is a very very high level of extra pair uh, paternity in this in this species, which is another reason why it's so so interesting and also kind of unique, um, because um, this is it was not considered to be common in many cooperative breeding birds, because one of the main mechanism for cooperative breeding pair strategy to be stable, which means that subordinates stay for years in the territory. It was uh, because it was considered a, a way for, for brothers to help raising other brothers or sisters. So helping the parents um, raising raising the offsprings. However, given that there is this super high level of extra pair paternity, the paradox, the paradox is that quite often this um, the subordinates help the parents raising offspring which with, with which they are not related at all because they are from from or or poorly because they are uh, their the sons and daughters from very different fathers far away how big is a male's territory and you mentioned that the female will come into the the early plumage sexy males territory so uh, i'm i'm trying to get an idea of how close are these different males territories to each other and uh are there female uh, and uh, let me let me phrase it better are male territories a different size to the female territories do females actually maintain a territory, the breeding female, or, uh, or how, how, how do they space themselves out? So they, they defend a territory as a group. So male dominant, all the subordinates, and the female. And, and these territories range from um, one, one hectare to two hectares and, and a bit more. And, um, and there are areas where like, they are densely packed very close to each other and some areas where, where uh, they are not and there is a lot of space uh, which is not occupied by territories uh, we have some areas in the park that are like that probably are, are um, uh, poorer areas in terms of, of quality of resources but yeah these little birds as you as you mentioned they're very very little they're like eight ten grams um, with this long long tail can can fly for few hectares exactly to the place where the 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 dominant male has the territory and um and this is quite 
fascinating because they they need to remember uh, this this mail for a long time and and and, and they need to plan. Um, it's something that is really really clearly planned um, the time and and when they go and where they go. So with with these adjoining territories that are held and managed by family cooperative groups, are uh, many of the different females from all of these groups all coming to see the one super duper early plumage male? That's correct. That's correct. That that it, it was it, what it happens, and and uh, most of the females go to to um, to the same male. And and uh, what is interesting is that there is not a, a, a an effect played by um, in a certain way, like socially. So the females don't see other females going to the to that male. So it's not um, it, it, all the females agree that that male is the sexiest. So they they independently go there, and that what uh, the researcher researchers found when did the genetic analysis. Of the of the offsprings, and uh, this is a quite clear quite clear pattern. So it's a it's a it's a kind of yeah, it's planned strategy. Okay, so all of the females within uh, within reach basically are coming and and are being inseminated by that male, but then do they go back to their family groups and then? And then, even though they've they've timed their fertilization perfectly for them, are they then still having sex with the dominant male in their family group? So he doesn't know he doesn't know what's going on. And he's still happy to to do the family rearing. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's correct. That's correct. And um, and um, another thing that um, was studied in, in Canberra is that. Um, actually, females get benefits from from having helpers because they can more easily go looking for for other males, and and uh, in a certain way, the presence of helpers of helpers um, liberates uh, the 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 female from from um, spending more effort feeding the offspring, and so it's kind of released and can spend more time looking for for males. Um, the best males, at least, yeah. and because uh, for female usually, and and this is not really my topic, but I've got colleagues studying studying this and and uh, are in, really interested in the behavior of the females. For female, it's really important to find a territory, so uh, that's the first thing, and and um, and sometimes it's not the best territory, and they're not the best males, so it's really important to keep track on where's the best male, and then in case um, divorce. From the from the male, especially if there is a um, um, a possibility to move to a better place, or when um, when the the subordinates, which usually are the son of of the of the female, start to to be dominant, so they they want to avoid any incest and and they don't want to to mate with their son, and so that's the moment where they divorce and they move to a, a different. A different territory and and all this happens during during the breeding season and is already really complex and fascinating but when you observe what happens during the non-breeding season there's a, another la layer of um of richness in in, uh, in social behavior which was what i was observing uh during during my phd so i spent also a lot of time during breeding season together with my colleagues because we had to find the nest for all the territories and, and find the, the, the nest is important because we can uh, bend um, the, the offsprings so that we know that the nestlings, when they will grow up, um, will be like the son and daughters of the social son and daughters of, of the territory, for example, and we can keep track of their identity and their life to see um, how will be their life and the, their success will will depend on, on what, mostly. But most of, as I was saying, most of the time during my PhD was during non-breeding non season. And in non-breeding season, these table groups, um, which are the breeding groups, male, female, and the, all the subordinates, um, 
start to aggregate with other breeding groups, forming like super, some super groups. And then these super groups merge with other stable groups, forming even upper upper social social units, which are quite stable and, and uh, split daily and, and then reform and uh, and um, and while doing that they they move in the landscape and then move out of their uh, breeding territories so um, when I start PhD most of the information we're saying that um, that the the, the species uh, defends territories year-round and what I've observe is that is not true and, and and in winter they form this stable strong aggregation um, of, and big social units which move in the landscape and, and have like a big area so yeah that, okay. that was unexpected okay. well, that, well that opens up to two questions what what is the size and the organization of a breeding group and then what is the the size and the organizational structure of this non-breeding marauding supergroup? Well, that's a that's a great question because it's really bigger. Um, um, so normally, like a, a breeding group could be um, so a male and female, so the, the 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 dominant individuals plus the helpers and, and helpers um, usually is one or two, rarely three or more. Um, so it's three, four, um, four individuals plus all the offspring um, and of the of the breeding season, especially of the last nest. Um, so the last nest of the springs um, in the last nest of the springs, most of the of the offspring then spend the winter together with mom and dad and, and they form like family group of seven, eight uh, individuals. The females disperse and some of the females disperse uh, at the beginning of the non breeding so after the breeding season um, and and uh, some some stay with the family group for all the winter and then disperse to a territory to look for a place at the end of non breeding season so usually in august um, august september and so this is like it's a quite quite big group during winter and then they mix with other groups sometime in a very stable way um so they are always together um, day after day with other groups of the same same uh, size. So for up to 10, 15 pairs together. And then these super groups can, can uh, in turn merge with other groups and super groups. So for groups of up to 25, uh, 30 individuals sometimes, which move together and stay together and apparently know each other um, well, and that's one of my questions: was the function of this why why this complex system um, evolved? Is there a clear dominant hierarchy in the bigger group? Well, that that's a great question. Seems not, um, but it's not something we we could uh, we could test. Um, but seems that they spend time all together and uh, um, and. Uh, one of the possibilities that that could be also a, a a way for males to advertise and uh, and so like the, the bluest the first to turn blue to advertise their quality to the to the female uh, before the following breeding season but um apparently is more related to this upper social social unit emerging is something more related to resources and predation and that's something that I'm testing uh, during during my PhD um, because the, the resources are, are scarcer in, in winter and so it's harder to find food. Um, many individuals die during winter and, uh, and, um, and the attacks of kookaburras and butcher bear increases during, during winter because these bears usually hunt mostly or more on arthropods and, and uh, lizards, skinks, um, during during summer and spring, in winter is harder. So we saw them following and tracking the, the groups and attacking and attacking songbirds. So this is one of the main main uh, predators together with goshawks for them. Now, what's the 
what's the site of your study at Torre? Well, that's a great question. I, I'm I'm really not sure because the, the park is quite big. Um, and uh, it's Listerfield Park, as close to Dandenong in, in, uh, in Melbourne. Um, and we have there many territories. I'm following 20, 25 territories. And, um, and each territory is something between one and two, two hectares. So altogether is, is quite big, the area I'm following. But there is more, like the, the, the population in the park is really bigger than, than the one I'm following. And, and other colleagues have other territories. So at, at the moment, are you working on your own or is it a team uh, investigating different aspects of of the fairy wren in the park yeah it's, it's more a teamwork um most of my colleagues are, are working on on the super fairy wrens some are working uh, on some are working on on the purple crown uh fairy wren so it's like similar and different species same genus but living north in, in the kimberley um but we are a stable group of three four people um, working on the on the superbs, and um, my colleagues are interested in in the uh, choice of the of females in uh, in um, personality and uh, in how temperature and climate change is affecting um, different features of 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 their life. So we we try to help each other collecting information, especially when when there is to miss nets and to capture all the birds because. A big, big effort is to have the population monitored. So we need to have information about all the individuals, male, females, find find a nest, and uh, and and keep doing it because females arrive like as immigrants. Um, so new birds keep coming. So it's a it's a massive work to to keep track of that and and try to keep the database organized and um, in order to to. To answer all the questions we we have in we have in mind, and and plus I've, I had colleagues helping me with with proper experiments when we had to do experiments, so we had to do uh, daily daily experiments in the in the field. Okay, well if if you can in a moment we'll we'll, we'll go through the methodology and what the experiments uh, are, but uh, let let's let's just clear up a few things about about the birds habits how many um breeding attempts can a group make in a season could do three four sometimes five um we had um psychopath females that kept building nests and then abandoning and then building another one and then abandon the nest and then another one um then depends on a lot on the level of predation um which varies um in in, in years and the level of of um or how often there are parasites and and uh, they so they need to abandon when when they understand they need to abandon the nest so is it, that, that so varies a lot are they So is it usually only one successful clutch in a in a season or can they sometimes get through two clutches? Sometimes even three. Um, three we had, we, successfully. We had, yeah, we had in good years, um, like the last one, that was really good, we had a lot of nestlings. It was massive amount of, of work and um, some territories had three successful clutches. So big groups. It was really, really hard to to keep track of the identity and and uh, and remember also all the combination, all the individuals. Because for us, every individual is a combination of of colors, so of of three uh, different colors all together in a unique combination. And sometimes there are really so many. Uh, it's it's hard uh, for the brain to to read quickly the color bands and and to remember all the combination. And and this last year, luckily for the fairy wren, at least in 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 our park, it was a really good year. So they had many clutches successfully. And a successful clutch will um, give you, on average, how many fledglings? Well, something like three usually. Yeah, 
it's more or less something like three, yeah. So you might get bet between sort of seven and ten chicks in a good year from from the dominant female. Exactly, that's correct. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about the the methodology. Um, and 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 you did mention that there were some questions that you were uh, posing with the with the research. But let's talk about the mist netting, that kind of operation. How how many of you does it take to do the mist netting? Uh, wet, what time do you do it? Is it better to do it early in the morning or in the afternoon? Um, what records do you take when you uh, when you are, uh, are trapping and handling birds and ringing them? And who who do you share that information with if there's um, uh, ongoing studies in you know you're doing the non breeding season. Somebody's doing the breeding season. So, yeah, I'm really interested in this cooperative gathering, uh, particularly as it's a stressful uh, uh, thing to push to put the bird through. So how does the information get pushed out? Who gets it and what exactly do you do? So, so um, in the years, since the group expanded, our research group expanded, we start to collect more and more and more information because more questions um, raised. And um, what always we, we, we collect is uh, the weight of the individuals, uh, if it's molting, and um, uh, some, some uh, measurement of the tarsus of the, of the head. And, um, and if we can, we can we sex the individuals that, that depends on, on on the period of the year because they are for for juveniles sometimes it's it's impossible to sex um, without doing the genetic analysis and um, so that's something we always do and then um, as, uh, we take blood samples for genetic analysis and um, and sometimes blood sample for hormones for for it's not what I'm doing but other colleagues do that and. Um, um, and sperm in um, in um, in the breeding season. In some males, we take sperms as well. And um, and another colleague is measuring personality when we capture the bird. And and as you were saying, um, capturing the bird is the most stressful moment for for the bird itself. I mean, also for us, but but mostly for the bird. So we try to collect all the information in in that in that moment so that. Um, we don't need to to get to capture him again or her again in uh, in the future, and it's something we usually do in, in group of twos, sometimes alone. But having a having a bigger group is better because you can open more, more nests. However, uh, we notice that um, especially in some period of the year there is high high risk of predation um, of kookaburras and butcher bears. So we need to be uh, many people in order to um, keep as always somebody checking the, the nets all the time and that's a protocol we, we, we inserted to to make sure that um, no predation during during mis netting happen, happen. So that that's a, a risk, a real risk in in, uh, in the park. Well any, anybody who's familiar with kookaburras and butcher birds, um, which uh, kookaburras are, are a large kingfisher and the uh, butcher bird is a um, is a corvid related to our Australian magpie. Uh, they're very very smart, so they would, I think, quite rapidly learn that when you guys are setting up, there's a big opportunity for a banquet. So, uh, how long how long do you think it it takes them to work out what you're doing and that? There's an opportunity for an easy breakfast. Uh, that's that's a great question. We don't know yet, but my, one of my um, colleagues in the past noticed this, and and uh, and she she thought the same individual of Cook, of Kookaburra was following her, and and knew and recognized and recognized the poles of the nets and and uh, and associate that to a reward, a positive reward in terms of a meal, and um, 
So we try to to move and not be back for too much time on the, on the same area. Also because of the of the birds, um, because uh, they learn like the, the the superbs are very very smart. Sometimes it's, it's scary how smart they are, and uh, and I think they they understand and they and they recognize us uh, carrying poles, especially if we we walk with a hat and then the poles they sometimes move away and then they don't just, just they don't show up for the entire day and they immediately move to a different area and, and some somehow communicate it to 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 the others and um so th that's that's one of the problem we don't want to stress too much and and uh, capture too much catch too much the birds because um that has consequences um also in, in the way we can study we can study their behavior without without affecting uh, it in the wild, which is one of the unique things of, of the Superbs Fairy Wren. You can really study them, you can get a lot of information being in the wild. Um, and, uh, and to me, it's, it's something really important um, to try to, to answer a biological question, not in the lab, but being in the wild and observing and trying to measure uh, things in the wild. That you're taking blood samples each time you are capturing birds. Yeah, we we try we try to to do it at the moment. Yes, yeah. I mean, not yeah. not if the birds, the same individual has already been caught like a few days before, unless there is a specific question related to to the change in hormonal behavior. Otherwise, we avoid to do that. So, um, that. I'm guessing that that's a fairly new um, process in the research of uh, of the of the wrens uh, with, amongst all the cooperative researchers that have been uh, working in in this uh, in this location as well as on fairy wrens generally. So, what has uh, what have those genetic um, samples? told you that you didn't expect to be true or to be the case so in, in our case we haven't used it yet is uh, we are collecting the genetic uh, the, the, the material to do genetic analysis but um since it's a quite a expensive process we are collecting all the information in order to send to a lab all, all, all together one, all at once exactly time, yeah. exactly exactly yeah. and then and then in order to minimize then all the um, also coding part of the work, which is part of the uh, writing codes in order to discriminate um, offsprings or, or relative individuals. Um, so now we are storing all the samples and, and soon, um, hopefully in, in a few months, we will send all the information. And, and we are interested in, in knowing who, personally, I'm interested in my population to know who is related to, to whom. To which other individuals, and if they can recognize um, each other, because um, one of the of the main uh, consequences of uh, biological consequences in, in terms of, of these complex societies um, and how they are structured is how cooperation and altruism can can spread in the population, and um, and, and um, altruism is is super important question in in uh, in, uh, in biology and is also a bit of a paradox in a certain way uh, because um, individuals to be altruist um, sacrifice something pay a cost in order to help somebody else and um, and, and and despite this um, this paradox um, in, a, in a Darwinian in a, in a naive Darwinian way um, Altruism is really common and widespread in nature, and all our trillions of cells cooperate with with each other, and and uh, and uh, uh, individuals of the same species usually cooperate, and sometimes individuals of different species also cooperate in in in, in the ecosystems. So this is quite widespread, and um, and the super population, the super fairy wren, and given that we have all the data about the social network and how often individuals spend time together how close they are it's it's a perfect system to test if they um 
like the co connectedness, how friends they are, is a good way um, to to predict if they're willing to pay a cost, um, and and uh, 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 to be altruist in order to save uh, somebody somebody else. So this is something we, uh, I'm I'm testing during during my my PhD. I'm using the social structure of this population to test um, questions about about altruism in uh, in wild animals. It's it's a massive question, isn't it? Because um, we we assume that all of the males that are helping the dominant female, they've all been duped. Yeah, yeah, so, that, that's true. So so we assume that they've been duped, but they may actually know. It just might be the way things are. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that, that that's correct, and and uh, um, what we we understand is that there is a, a, a landscape in in the, in the population of of genetic relatedness. Um, so even if they're not brother and sister, um, given that in cooperative breeding species um, there are um, individuals that stay with the parents and stay in the territory for years and years. Um, this brings to what we call as social viscosity, so that the, the, the population um, has less migrants and individuals tend to move less. And so uh, this as a consequence um, as the fact that in, in the average, individuals tend to be more related, related with, with each other, even if sometimes not at the same at the, at the level of the breeding groups, as we were saying before, but in, clo in, uh, in uh, close breeding groups, in breeding territories, there is some kind of genetic, genetic relatedness. So I, I want to know if they know that, if individuals know that and, and, uh, and uh, are able to, to predict and, and uh, behave according, accordingly, or if it's simply a question of friendship, how, how much time they spend together, if they can really choose who they want to help and according with some, some particular criteria. But for sure, they, they, they do help and they do show this amazing behavior um, that is typical of, of these and other species, which is called the rodent run behavior. And I remember how I felt the first time I observed it in the wild. It's really, really interesting. So when one individual, usually of the group, is in real danger, is captured by a, by a predator or sometimes is in our nets, um, gives um, a distress call, which is a call for help. And, uh, and um, when other individuals hear this, these calls, come closer and try to distract, to get the attention of the predator. And, and um, they do this deceptive behavior, like showing to have a, a, a broken wing mm. and, and walk like a like a like a rat. Uh, that's why it's called road and run. And it's really funny. And uh, and um, and it's really really effective. They 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 do it to us sometimes when when they when we miss net. And so when I observed that, I thought it was a great way to cause altruist be altruistic behavior be, to to measure altruistic behavior because this is what it is. They risk their life. To do that, they come very close to the predator, sometimes up to one meter and a half, one meter, to 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 get the attention in order to help their their mates, and um, and so this is what I, what I'm studying, and and uh, and in order to know if they can recognize um, individuals from from the voice, uh, we recorded all the the voice of all the individuals when they give this this stress call in the in the net, and then we run. Um, some 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 algorithms and functions to test if they um, could dis if they if their calls their voice is different. So as as we have different voices and and I can recognize your voice, I can recognize the voice of a friend. If they can do the same, if when they hear somebody calling, they can know who is calling and if they want to decide to help or not according with the identity of the caller. That, that really does raise some interesting questions, doesn't it? Whether they can recognise their social group or um, perhaps their relatives. And that, that question of in, when they're moving around in that non-breeding 
um, sort of super group, do they actually know who their relatives are? That's a, that's a fascinating question. Um, Atore, I, I mentioned earlier that I was familiar with um, with the superb, super, I keep wanting to call it the superb blue wren because uh, that was what I grew up with, but the superb fairy wren. Uh, I've, I've seen that um, distracting behaviour in, in my backyard there. The other behaviour I've seen them exhibit as a group is mobbing birds like wattle birds and magpie larks and even individual magpies. Uh, is, is that common behaviour or is that a localised kind of thing that they might learn and not every group will do the mobbing? No, it's it's quite common and and um, and uh, an important behavior um, because as I was saying at the beginning, since they are ground dweller birds, they are really um, um, at, always at risk uh, of of predation. So they are very vulnerable on that sense. So mob, uh, active mobbing, and they do it usually together with tornbills, at least in in uh, and uh, there is a cloud of 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 sounds. Um, of torbills mobbing and and uh, and uh, scrub wrens, which is a unique unique sound. Which um, that, that but that's another topic. Recently, it has been shown that um, lyrebirds can can mimic this mobbing behavior of torbills altogether, um, and is really really effective. And I, I found I, I heard this, and and it was really interesting because it really remind me that the proper mobbing behavior. Um, this is um, is super. It's a very important important behavior for for these birds because it's a way to um, attack uh, the predators and also to teach um, or show other individuals how a predator is and and what needs to be considered a threat. Um, so it's a uh, it's a really important behavior and it's quite common, especially during winter when they are in these big flocks. Uh, they do it a lot. They tend to to mob, and and have a unique unique call for that is um, the, the the mobbing call. Yeah, when when you mentioned the thornbills, um, uh, I I certainly saw them with brown thornbills and uh, and the scrub wren, the white brown scrub wren that that was there, but not the striated or the yellow yellow tailed thornbills. They, from my memory, I mean, I couldn't say it was always like that. But the brown thornbills were the were certainly the ones that were joining in on the uh, on the mobbing, mobbing. They seem a bit more pugnacious than uh, than the other varieties. Um, That's for sure, and and they they live in usually very um, very close to uh, each other, especially in winter. They form mixed species flock, and and so it, also fan tails. Fan tails uh, uh, mob a lot, uh, and sometimes they are the first to mob. Um, but yeah, mostly these four species spend a lot of time together, and they for they have similar foraging guild uh, close to the ground in in uh, in, uh, in bushes, and don't go as you were saying before to the canopy. So they tend to mob together because they share similar threats and predators, and and, and yeah. So if if those species are spending their non-breeding. Uh, time together and and forming these mixed flocks, are they exploiting the same food resources, or do they have a slightly different uh, sort of trophic level of the uh, of the food resource? I think they they um, they don't um, compete. Um, um, I mean, they in a certain way probably their foraging level over overlap. But um, um, supers tend to uh, forage more on the ground, while um, torbills tend to follow them and stay closer, but but tend to forage on on uh, low branches or on on the on the bush. So also the way they 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 hunt is different. Um, are more gleaner uh, the torbills while the the the. The superbs really hunt, hopping in the ground and sometimes jumping, uh, and you see them in the ground jumping and to catch uh, insects and, and uh, butterflies and moths from from the ground. 
So when you think about it, these mixed flocks moving through an area must really uh, clean it out <laughs> in a day. So they they probably need to move quite substantial different uh, distances in the uh, in the in the off season. Um, do they do they have to stock up? Um, I'm I'm thinking of I've, I've interviewed a lot of people lately about shorebirds, migratory shorebirds, and they arrive in their non-breeding territories and then have to stock up because it's such a long, long trip back. Uh, is the breeding season um, there? Does it take an awful lot of resources for the group to to carry out the the cooperative breeding? Uh, defending the territory. So do they really need to fatten up in the non-breeding season? Well, it's mostly during during the day for this uh, for this long these uh, very small songbirds because they tend and and this is quite common in songbirds they tend to lose weight um, and so so very very quickly because of the high metabolism they have and, and the fact that they lose a lot of heat. So they tend to try to gain. Um, um, Wait in the in the in at the end of the day, um, so that they they can survive survive the the night. Um, even if uh, recently it has been shown that super fairy wren and uh, um, have torpor, and in winter can really go down with the temperature, and probably is a way to survive um, cold nights during 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 winter. But yeah, there is an oscillation in in, in weight um during mostly during the day um but then for sure um it is not that they uh, get fat like migratory birds but for sure um the 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 breeding season is really really um expensive in terms of of energy um especially for for pairs that don't have helpers because helpers contribute feeding and so they um, they help and they release some of the of the pressure from from the female. Now you, you just mentioned torpor, so let's explain what that is uh, for people who may not have heard it before. That's a state where the bird doesn't actually hibernate, but it it's almost it's almost a sleep state, isn't it? I'm not an expert on the, on the topic, but. That's that's why my way of understanding is just uh, reduce the um, all the metabolic functions, but still being being uh, being alive, in order to yeah to to lose less um, less energy. Yeah, and if they if they recognise an alert call from another species, they can sort of snap to and 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 uh, and disappear, protect themselves, hide. Um, so take flight. Um, what what I wondered when you mentioned those cold nights in in winter how how does a family group roost? Do they roost together? Do they make use of a disused nest? I mean, uh, are they sitting on branches together, or are they uh, are they in a nest? How do they do it? So they they have their uh, dormitory area each each group. Um, so they always go to their to the same place. It's, it's the place where they sleep is the same branch usually, and uh, and they sleep all together, not on a nest, but just they stay on on the branch and they um, come come close to each other and, and sleep together. It's it's really nice and interesting to observe. And um, is there when when they are in their um, little family family groups we don't know yet do we how closely related they might all be and if they're all brothers and sisters uh sleeping together yeah exactly it, it, we don't know and and i think they don't know either uh, they 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 might have an idea um uh, but but pro probably they they don't know um that's what we are trying to understand. If there is a way, there is some some um, some signal in the call, in the voice, um, but um, yeah, we will need a lot of data to answer to answer um, to answer this question. But for sure, 
they they know each other and, and uh, yeah they take care uh, of each other and and uh, even if they're not um brothers and sisters for 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 example an older subordinate uh, an older helper which will inherit the dominant position in the future and this is quite quite common in, in the super fairy ren usually 60 percent of the males that are helpers at the end become uh become dominant of their of their territory so having having somebody having a, a subordinate and taking care of your subordinate is something um in a certain way um uh, good uh which offers a lot of advantage because then will will mean less work uh for you in the future and more um what we call dilution effect so the bigger is the group the lower is the probability to be predated and also many eyes together to look for predators so it's like a safer safer place to be so there are many advantages of of being together in a group even if um like the, the bird um we, you are like sharing all, all your time with is not your relative i'll throw one at you from left field because you mentioned you've uh, worked in in other countries and on other uh, animals, animal types. How how similar do you think the the fairy wren society is to something that we've become quite familiar with through TV in recent years, the meerkat uh, grouping? There is something that is really similar. They're both cooperative cooperative breeders, and um, uh, so the, the the main mechanism is is quite similar even if some of the rules, the, the machinery inside on how the groups and the stability of the group is maintained is, is quite different. For example, in birds, usually it's the female that, uh, that uh, disperses, so that, that goes away, while, while in mammals it is the contrary. Um, but since, since you touched this, um, this topic, um, one of the, the main thing I'm, I'm, I'm working at, on at the moment is the fact that um, yeah, the, the society of the superb in a certain way could be really si more similar and on this being a multi-level society, as I was saying before, to some to society of very different animals, such as baboons, killer whales, elephants, um, and even zebras. And, um, and uh, these societies in groups that in a predictable way merge together, forming upper social units, it was something that was uh, considered to exist only in animals, mammals mostly, with big body and very big brain and and long long life, and because it was thought to be very demanding in terms of cognitive um, cognitive power, being able to track all the identity of the individuals inside the group, but also of other groups, and um, and and what what we are finding at the moment is that. Superbs have this this society and is really similar to the one of elephants and killer whales and even sperm whales in a certain way, and there are very small birds of nine, eight, ten grams, and that this could be more common um, in in all the animal kingdom given some some particular rules, some particular features. That's not an answer I expected to get. Uh, <laughs> fascinating, fascinating. I've only really got uh, sort of one more question about the the fairy wrens, Atore, is um, how how long is the lifespan of a dominant male or female and is it different to the subordinates in the group? Do they live longer or shorter or the same amount of time? No, they, they, um, they live more or less the same amount of time. Um, and usually subordinates in the future will become dominant. Um, so so it's, a, it's, a kind of, it's a kind of hierarchy. And um, after the four years, the probability of dying increases. Um, and especially uh, we observe um, that most of the, of the birds dying um, die during, during winter. And uh, especially for the super, for the for the older males that, that tend to mold into the breeding plumage during winter to be the sexiest, this is really costly, and many of them die while trying, because probably it's really um, costly in terms of 
um, of metabolism and but also being blue when all the other are brown um it's, it's costly because um predators target you immediately and um uh, but usually they they live uh, in, at least in our in our population they live something like males uh three four years and uh, we have individuals of five years at the moment but um there are some individuals known um from from records um to 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 live for 10 years so that's quite quite interesting to be a a, a song a little songbird um because it's really different from what we observe in the north northern hemisphere where bears live one or two years so that, that's all birds of that that size um but in the southern hemisphere and in the tropic um bears tend to live longer and have a um, different life history and um which is yeah. particularly good to study social behavior because they they live long definitely and of course since we're talking about a complex social organization um one uh, one answer prompts another question when uh, when the dominant or the super sexy male um loses his position either th well mostly through death we will assume there's this layer of um brothers or cousins of males how how do they determine uh what's the process of selection for the next super sexy male so in the territory usually um it's just the death um when when the dominant uh dies the following subordinates and and the and the hierarchy in in the in the subordinates is really stable uh okay, will, so you, will, it, will inherit the, the position okay the so problem it, is it, it's a it's already organized it's not like all of the males all of the subordinate males are all on one level we have a a, a defined hierarchy within that group yeah it's, it's pretty clear yes and they and i i think they know and um uh, some sometimes they can um, um subordinates can have a different strategy uh, they can it's called fission and and they can um, get their own territory split the, the main territory in two and get half of the territory and, and if they find a, a female and stay there and but otherwise they will just inherit the dominant position of their previous group okay well i look forward to reading uh your work when uh, when it's completed how long have you got to go to uh to submit and then go through the process of of defending it which i which i learned today can be a very very stressful uh situation yeah um yeah i'm afraid it could be very stressful and um uh, i still have more or less one year a bit less so at the moment i'm just i i already collect all the all the data i needed and um, i'm just writing up and writing writing the manuscripts and the thesis so yeah and i will enjoy these last these last months just putting together and framing the stories of of what i ob observed in, uh, in the years of the fieldwork yeah i spoke to someone uh recently atore who told me that uh while they were completing their phd uh they did their field work then every day, every night, they went down to the pub and then uh, got up the next day, did their field work. And then when they were writing up after they'd collected all their data, they still had time every day to go down in the afternoon to the pub. Is, <laughs> that, <laughs> is that how you're finding it? Well, not, not really. I trying to find time for myself. But, um, and, and I feel when you write, it's easier uh is mostly the big the big part is as um uh is field field work because um if you want to collect enough information you need to spend a lot of time in the field and uh, what i really learned from from phd is that you need to be really flexible because so many times things go wrong and don't go the way you expected and any things like uh gears uh can stop the work when you need it and um uh, and sometimes you you expect to see something and you go there you design the experiment 
takes months and then you go there and the animals don't do what you expect um and that happened to me also and so that, that is quite stressful and and um now i feel that is more relaxed because it's mostly writing and and but at least i, I know what to expect um uh, because i've already got the data yes well um you have to really feel for those people who had selected sites that got uh, burnt out in the bushfires. Um, yeah. That that really messes up your your research program. But hopefully, hopefully, all of the institutions have been accommodating with extensions and whatnot for that work to to be able to be done. But we digress. Um, I hope you will uh, give me a summary when. Uh, when you're ready to uh, to defend the work once it's um, sort of in the public domain and we can talk about what you finally did discover and what all that genetic work um, brought out. Look, and, and we haven't even talked about your ringing, your ringing system and the um, how you can identify the, the individuals. So there's, there's still a lot of things to, uh, to talk about, but I want to talk about you now, Atore. When, when, when did you become interested in birds, or are birds only part of the the wider tapestry for you? Um, well, I got really interested in birds when I was ten, um, and uh, I, I was interested in general in animals, but then birds. I realized that they are everywhere. They are vocal. They are colorful, and. Uh, and it's you can go around in the city and, and observe them and, and uh, ask questions why wave mammals is so harder um, or fish. Uh, I, I was not living close to the sea, so it was harder as well. And uh, and uh, and since ever, I've always been interested in in, uh, in birds and then from there in general in biology and evolution and in, in broader in broader questions. Um, and but I still try to use birds as a, as a model species to answer my my questions because i'm still really related and uh, connected to 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 birds as a group of animals as a 10 year old in italy um what were the the familiar birds to you what was your um what environment were you living in as a kid in italy so it, it is in the north of Italy and um, is quite like hills and uh, and um, mountains. So we we have many of the common finches, uh, blackbirds, and uh, some little owls and uh, peregrine falcons and uh, and uh, I mean many many interesting birds, robin. Um, but to me, not comparable to to what Australia or South America uh, offer, um, like especially Australia, like the, the great variety of birds and songs and um, that there is here. And, um, so I'm I'm really happy to to study birds here instead of in Italy. So, where where was you? you you briefly ran us through your academic journey, like with some time in Germany at uh, Max Planck and whatnot. But where, when you, well, where, where did you do your undergrad work, and and where has your academic career taken you? So I did my under. Um, I studied in Bologna in Italy, and uh, and I I went to Iceland um, for some months uh, in the fjord in the north to study. Um, social behavior of, of seabirds and interaction between different species of seabirds, in particular a species of gull and the common either. And, uh, and I really enjoyed it, but um, I felt it was, it was a bit cold for me. Um, so um, after, after Bachelor, I, I, I moved to the Amazon, involved in another project with Macos in Peru. And, uh, and uh, that was really, I, I found like the right place for me there and then I came back out there four times in different expeditions and and working on uh, mixed uh, species flocks and uh, communication and alarm calls in the Peruvian Amazon, and um, and then I work on mixed species flocks on the population uh, from from uh, from Oxford uh, when I was in Germany. That was after my master, 
and uh, and after that I, I moved to to Australia and I started to work on the on the little superbs which species of macaw were you looking at I was looking at um, different species of, of macaws um, mostly the the red and green and the scarlet scarlet macaws um, it was a, a population of a conservation population of macaws so they were um, um, like the main the main study it was on um, this this behavior which is the clay leaking so all the all the macaws land on on the on the clay to to eat the clay in the morning and and um, it was a long monitor of these long term monitors and, um, and it was really really incredible incredible country and beautiful place now one of the stock questions I ask everyone at Torre is what's your field guide of choice now you've been birding uh, in Italy uh, in Italy obviously and Iceland in South America and now in Australia so run us through what your library is for identifying the birds you see in the different locations so which uh, which book precisely i have yeah what 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 do you prefer to use when let, let's let's start with what book did you use when you were a kid in italy uh, i tried to get all the possible books and there were not so many <laughs> so um yeah all the all the guys there is one that is very good that is collins um and um and uh, that was in english so i didn't speak english i was just looking at the figures um and um and uh, after that um there is one really good that is um for peru that is my bible and came with me that is the Priston guide um of peruvian birds and uh, and came with me for the four different expeditions in the amazon and it's already it's completely brown and and uh, changed color and it's full of uh, fungi and then uh yeah uh, everywhere i go i try to get a guide as as in the world as a as a souvenir or, or to study in the future and, and when i was a kid friends were sending me guides from places that i didn't even know and uh and uh but then yet yeah, uh, i still like to have them and, and imagine new travels and but for australia i mostly use an app um uh, which is this new new thing that I didn't have when I was uh, a kid, uh, which is quite quite good because uh, even if the, um, um, the 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 images are not are not the best, uh, there's still um, the call for each bird, so you can listen to the call. And since I'm really interested in calls and songs, is a way to learn and to to immediately check without carrying a book. Um, uh, the distribution, the species, the identity, and, and, and the call of the birds. And since you're using the app in Australia for identification, but you are a collector of field guides, are you still buying the other field guides? Have you got the Australian bird guide in your bookshelf? Yes, yes, I have yeah. it. I have it. It was one of the first books when I arrived here at, at university. Yeah. yeah. And... Do you have the other field guides as well? Do you have the Slater guide, the Morecambe guide, Simpson and Day? No, I, I've got just that one. And uh, I recently got one on uh, by Ron Clark, um, with, who's a professor at, at my, my university, on where to find birds, uh, which I'm really, I'm really enjoying um, at the moment. Yeah. It's a terrific book. Terrific book. And um, yeah. uh, Rowan, uh, to terrific uh terrific ornithologist yeah great, he's... A, a great body of work behind him um when you are out in the field what would you say is your essential piece of equipment what can't you live without binocular for sure yeah. well without without binocular uh, I'm, I'm useless um and uh, for my work if i need to read the color bands of the birds i need i need my binocular and then um, notebook, or sometimes I write um, data on on on, uh, on the on the phone, um, and um, and then depends on the on the experiment. Uh, I need other other gears like speakers, mostly speakers and recorder um, for for calls and songs. Now, 
Now that's really interesting to me. It's all right. What what speakers? What sort of size would you take out? And and are you playing the sounds through your phone, or do you take another recorder out for playback? How do, how do you organise that? Yes, we have a particular uh, speaker, which is a Twitter, um, um, which is able to to um, produce um, and and uh, give without distorting um, high pitch um, calls. So we is which is particularly important for for birds, and um, so I have that which I co um, I connect to a battery at the moment, a uh, um, twelve volts batteries, and um, and. Uh, uh, I've got a, also a recorder, and um, which is a, a Tascam um, 45, and um, and to record to record um, songs, and and mostly I'm using it to record the distress calls. So when when um, when, when I got uh, a bird in the in the net, I come closer, more or less uh, 40, 50 centimeters, and I record um, the voice, and then I use sonograms to to analyze this. The, um, this the spectrum of the, of the of the voice, and that's just a handheld recorder. You're not taking out a directional microphone with a parabola or anything like that. Not here. Uh, we use that uh, in the Amazon a lot. Uh, that was the normal equipment there, um, because the, the environment is more dense and the bears uh, were were farther away. Further um, away. Yeah. yeah. So so we we needed something something like that. Here is not really necessary because, like, when the birds are in the net, uh, I can come come quite close, and so uh, it's quite easy to to get a good recording uh, with good quality. And that's just using like the XY microphones on the recorder. Yeah, 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 okay. yeah that's yeah, correct. I think, I think, I think a lot of people are familiar with the, the handheld yeah. recorders, whether they be a Tascam or a Zoom or a Roland or whatever. But they're all very yes. similar. Yeah, yeah okay. exactly. Okay. Um, what's your favourite bird? Ah, that's a, that's a hard question. I don't know if I have a favourite bird. Um, when I was in Iceland, I really loved the Arctic tern. Um, and I, I found it amazing how, how far they can fly and how long is their uh, migratory journey. And uh, here... Um, I, I don't know which which bird in Australia I, I particularly like, but in general I, I like doorbells a lot. I really I really enjoy uh, doorbells and and uh, and uh, how they, especially brown doorbells, even if it's really common, how they can um, mimic uh, alarm calls and calls and and all their complex songs. And uh, and in South America. Uh, Maybe the the musician wren, which is uh, is an um, amazing bird that that gives uh, one of the best songs I've I've never heard. It's really really beautiful. Is that a true wren? No, no, um, I don't think so. I don't think it's a it's a true wren. That's another one of these old world old world southern hemisphere uh, mimic families. Um, I'm not familiar with that one, so I'll, I'll, I'll be looking that up after we after we finish speaking. Yeah, um, especially the, the the song, and um, it's so beautiful. And and um, and researchers found that in many indigenous people, uh, traditional songs, there is the the motif of the of of this of this uh, of this bird. So it's quite quite culturally important bird in in all the Amazon basin. And it. And it's a rainforest bird, or is it yes. more an open woodland bird? Lowland rainforest. rainforest. Yes. Lowland. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Terrific. Um, where's your bucket list location to go and see some birds? Um, I I just like to travel, and uh, where I go, I I just try to learn. Um, more more than than a Twitcher, I'm really into learning where species are where i can find species what is their call what is their behavior and uh, like the, the the ecology of 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 the place 
um, so where I can find some species. Um, and I would really love to, to be able to, to hear a call and know where I am that, that in the world, I think that's one of the, um, one of the, the most beautiful thing for a, for a ornithologist. And where is your favorite place that you've been birding so far? Uh, the Amazon for sure. Yeah. 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 The, Any... the, the, yeah. The Amazon rainforest, um, it's for sure the, the best place. Um, I've never been and, um, and it's so dense of life. So, 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 so hard at the same time to see bears. Uh, that is a, a challenge and, um, all the time it's, it's so dense and sometimes it's just walking. You feel like walking at the bottom of the sea. You don't see really what is around you and like everything is the same. It's just dense and green and, and you hear calls and voices of birds from everywhere, from the ground, from the canopy and um yeah it's it's really magic uh, if if you like birds i feel rainforest in general have you have you been to any of the australian rainforest sites yet yes but not the not the entry yet I, I want to go soon i would really love to go soon um i i did some bear watching on the gondwanian rainforest i mean on all, all the temperate rainforest and then up to the Gondwanian rainforest, which I really love, a uh, beautiful place. And I would like to keep going up and explore also the northern part and, and also New Guinea would be, would be a dream. Yeah, the New Guinea highlands would be amazing, wouldn't they? Um, yeah, for sure. So what's your bucket list bird? What, what, what do you mean? Well, is there one bird that you haven't seen that you've got um, you dream about that you, um, you know you, you want to see a scarlet ibis? You've probably already done that one. Uh, maybe it's the uh, Ragiana bird of paradise. I don't know. Well, he, here uh, in in Australia, uh, in Australia, I feel uh, in general the birds of paradise and bower birds um it's something i really want and then um uh, yeah yeah mostly mostly these these bears is something i would really love to to see yeah have all you, all of them have you seen the satin bower bird yet yeah I, I i saw the satin bower bird yes yes that's the only bower bird i've seen so far okay yeah oh well, i i hope you get to see the regent bower bird that's yeah. uh, that's pretty stunning yeah, good good luck with that with that one thanks um, when your uh when your work comes to an end will you um will you will you give me a summary will you uh, come on again and uh, talk to me i would be very happy um to to yeah to to tell um what, what we what we have um collected and and how we put all the stories together and have a better and more coherent story of of this research, uh, absolutely. One of the great things that, that I'm learning about research um, as I come in from a completely different perspective is how your work builds on the previous work that people have done and then what you find out, find out will open up more doors and raise more questions for the next team uh, to come along and try and answer those. So it's, um, it's really adding a huge amount of knowledge uh, to one of our most recognisable little garden birds in, in South East Australia, or certainly when I was a, a kid, they were, they were everywhere. Um, unfortunately, not, uh, not quite so much. Um, maybe, maybe you guys your team will unlock the answer of why the numbers are declining, even though those urban habitats that they used to be so frequent in um, are expanding. The, it would seem the number of opportunities for them to, uh, to exist in all these local reserves and new developments would seem to be, be there, but they're not. So 
That, that's true. That's true. That's one of the main main question I think for conservation of many songbirds. Um, there is one trait that is for sure is is uh, um, habitat fragmentation and habitat loss. Uh, even fragmentation when it's not lost directly, um, and that affects um, social structure of population and genetics and many processes, um, but also climate change. And, and I think uh, we will know some something more from uh, about relationship between climate change and, and um, decreasing in population of songbirds um, from the research of, of many great scientists that are investigating this topic at the moment. Well, you've you've done most of your field work now, so the hard slog is with the data analysis and writing up your uh, your, your thesis and uh, and then that process of defending. So hopefully it uh, it goes well. I'm sure it will be, and that we'll be talking with Doctor Atore uh, next time we we have a chat. Thanks for joining us on the Bird of, Bird Emergency. I'm Grant Williams. He's almost Dr. Atore. Eh? <laughs> thanks, thanks for having me. And hopefully I will be doctor yeah, in the future. Yeah, uh, I'm sure you will be. Thanks for listening. See you next time. Thanks. Bye.